Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our CAMS Campfire session on eating disorders and autism. Uh, my name is Andre Tomlin. I'm from The Mental Elf, and it's a pleasure to chair this session this evening. Uh, we've got lots of hellos already in the Zoom chat. Do introduce yourself if you haven't already. Uh, it's really good for us to see who we've got in the meeting, and it's lovely to see such a variety of people. We always have lots of people and a real mix of people at these sessions. So do please say hello, tell us your name, tell us where you're from um, as we go along. And do please use the chat to just share your thoughts and comment as we go along and to ask any questions that you have uh, for our panelists. So we're talking this evening about eating disorders and autism, and we've got a really fantastic panel. Uh, first of all, we have Francesca, that's Dr. Francesca Solmi from UCL Psychiatry in London. Uh, Francesca is a psychiatric epidemiologist and she's written one of the studies that we're gonna be talking about this evening. We also have Lisa, uh, that's Dr. Lisa Dinkler from Karolinski Institute in Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, she's also a psychiatric epidemiologist and she's also written a paper that we're gonna be talking about tonight. So regular audience uh, members for these CAMS campfires is going to you're going to notice something straight away that's a bit different this evening. We've got two papers that we're going to be talking about. We normally have a paper that we focus on. This evening we've got two papers. And they're about the same thing. They're trying to answer the same question. They do it in a slightly different way, uh, with a sl slightly well, with a very different group of people. Um, some from England and some from Sweden. Um, but we thought we'd talk about them both together um, because they do um, highlight some interesting differences um, and they do help us kind of move forward uh, the science in this area. So really interesting that we're covering two papers. Uh, and we also have, um, I'm delighted to say, uh, a young person with lived experience of eating disorders and autism. Her name is Lucy um, and she's a young woman from London and she's going to be sharing her lived experience this evening. As always at these CAMS campfires, we like to um, have a young person present who can reflect on what happens in the conversation and share their own thoughts and ideas. Um, my co colleague Douglas, Douglas Badenoch, is also on our panel, and you'll be hearing from Douglas later. Uh, he's a co-founder and director of the National Elf Service with me. Uh, he's an information scientist like me, and he's got a black belt in critical appraisal skills, unlike me. Um, so first of all, tell us what you, um, what profession best matches your, um, you. Tell us who you are. Um, there's a poll that's just popped up on your screen. Hopefully there's something in this list that relatively closely matches what you do. Uh, if you can just choose one of those, that will really help us get a sense of who we've got here in the room for the webinar. Okay, so thanks very much for everyone who answered that. As usual, we've got a really nice mix of people. Uh, it looks like the biggest single group here this evening is educational professionals. We've also got um, a good sized group of psychiatrists, uh, CAMS professionals, clinical psychologists, psychotherapists, students. Yeah, really nice mix of people. Um, so I, think poll, I think we need a new poll. Other is the biggest category. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess we could have a list of a couple of hundred things, couldn't we? Um, a couple of hundred different groups that people come from. But yeah, maybe we need to revisit, Douglas. That's absolutely right. Um, so I'm just going to kind of put this conversation into perspective. Um, as somebody who reads a lot of mental health research, eating disorders is a topic that we've covered a lot on the mental health blog and it's a topic that um, is very much in the minds not just of researchers but obviously of people who provide services um, and it's something that uh, is generally thought of as we don't know as much about it as we should we don't provide a 
a good enough service for young people. We don't understand enough from research. Maybe we're not funding research as much as we should. Um, but really stark statistics that, that pop up all the time about eating disorders um, has the highest mortality of any mental health condition. Really serious disabling condition. And yet we're not investing as much in understanding it and helping people as we could. Of course, in the UK, we've invested a whole lot more in eating disorder services over the last decade or so. And that has really helped to reduce some of the waiting times and provide better services for young people. But we've also seen higher rates of mental illness generally in young people since the pandemic um, and really worrying increased numbers of young people at risk of eating disorders that's being reported very regularly at the moment. It's estimated that about 20 to 30% of people with anorexia nervosa will also meet diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder. So there's a definite comorbidity between these two conditions. It's a definite link here. And that's really what we're gonna talk about this evening. We're gonna focus on that group. What is the link between eating disorders and autism? So Lisa, I'm gonna ask you initially to just give us a bit of a um, introduction to that. Give us a flavor of what we know and importantly, what we don't know about the link between eating disorders and autism. Um, first of all, I would say there's really a lot we don't know. Uh, the research until now has mostly focused on the link between anorexia nervosa and autism. There is actually quite little research on the other eating disorders, including bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, and also the less well studied, uh, the, the rest category, other specified feeding and eating disorders. Um, so that's the first thing I would like to say. And then when it comes to anorexia nervosa and autism, I think the evidence so far is uh, really unclear. You mentioned this estimate of uh, 20 to 30% of people with anorexia will meet diagnostic criteria for autism. And that's only one of the numbers out there, actually. I would say there is a broad range uh, between four and 50 percent of the people with anorexia will meet autism uh, criteria. And that broad range really tells us that we don't know much. Um, and I think we're going to discuss this uh, much more, why this is the case um, and how we can get closer to the real number, maybe. OK, so it sounds like there's a lot more that we don't know than there is that we do know. Um, Francesca, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I know. I think Lisa has been very comprehensive in, in her answer, and I think I saw a comment popping up also on the, on our feed uh, being another eating disorder that has not really been studied particularly with relevance to autism. And I think this might be something else that we touch upon today at some point. So give us, Francesca, a bit of a kind of um, overview of what we think the links may be and some of the ideas, some of the mechanisms, some of the ideas around why we think young people have eat, who have eating disorders may also have autism or it, autism traits, as you sort of refer to in your paper. Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of the research so far um, has focused on clinical samples, so samples of adolescents that were in treatment for anorexia. And what has been observed is that um, a lot of, uh, as we said, between 5 to 50 percent of people in these samples had um, traits that resemble very much those uh, that are seen uh, in people with, uh, with autism. Um, and the, what we don't really know is whether it's, what is the direction of the association between these two conditions? So is it because, is it a true comorbidity? Uh, so is it true that women with anorexia or men with anorexia have incre this increased rates of autism? Or is it something about being acutely ill with anorexia that makes, uh, that causes some symptoms to resemble very much those that we see in autism. So I think this is what, uh, where we are at, and in some of the studies, the studies that Lisa and I uh, have done that we're discussing today, have tried to get at uh, this answer really as to, is it something, are people with autism then at increased risk because perhaps there's something about um, the cognitive rigidity that is seen as, in autism or difficulties with social communication and that constitute a risk to develop anorexia? Uh, 
or is perhaps uh, being very ill with anorexia being malnourished that causes changes in behaviors that makes uh, people uh, behave in ways that is similar are similar to those that we see in people with autism so I think this is is where we are in terms of what we think might be happening. Thank you. I want to bring in Lucy now. Um, and I think Lucy, one thing to say is that obviously you can't be um, given the weight of representing everyone out there with autism and eating disorders. You're just one person with lived experience and you've got your own particular story and, and perspective on all of this. But I'm really interested in hearing your reflections on what Lisa and Francesca have said there and your experience of having these two conditions. Yeah, sure. Um, I think firstly, just to pick up on what Lisa said about how research kind of only really focuses on anorexia. Um, I think that's significant because for people like me who have kind of experienced multiple eating disorders as they would be kind of categorized, um, I've had anorexia, I've had binge eating disorder and I've had bulimia um, and I've struggled with, you know, autistic symptoms alongside all of them conditions. Um, I think I'm not a unique case in that sense because a lot of people who have eating disorders will slide across the spectrum throughout their lives. Um, and I think more research needs to be done kind of into that area and across all different types of eating disorders not just anorexia. Um, but in terms of what Francesca said as well, what I do know is that when I had anorexia, that was the point at which my symptoms became worse. Um, and I think that's because the effects of the restriction on my body and brain kind of amplified um, my my rigid mindset and my black and white thinking and my isolation and inability to kind of socialize and interact so I think that you know I don't know the answer I don't know what the cause is but I think it definitely both factors came into play and um I think that you know that def definitely does have an effect on worsening symptoms Thank you. Thank you for being so open and for sharing. Um, I totally get that that's not always easy to do. So really appreciate you joining us and, and sharing in this way. Um, I wondered, Lisa and Francesca, if you've got anything you want to add or reflect on after what Lucy's saying now. I think I think it's, it's yeah, I, just to echo that what we know is about anorexia so which what Lisa was touching upon earlier and, and Lucy also just said and we know a lot less on, on bulimia and all these other symptoms but it's um it was interesting to hear Lucy's experience. Thank you for sharing um the peace pathway Barry I thought it would be fairly soon that somebody will post the peace pathway link this is the um pathway for eating disorders and autism um developed from clinical experience um that's a really great resource and some, something we've blogged about and it will certainly be one of the resources that we add to our list um, for the event so but yes thanks very much for sharing that it's definitely worth having a look at if you haven't seen it yet so I think it's time now to um, to focus down on the particular two pieces of research that we're going to tackle uh, one that Francesca led and one that Lisa led and Douglas is going to talk us through those now uh, and then we're going to have a bit more of a specific conversation about those papers so over to you Douglas. Thanks very much, Andre. Um, I'm just going to do the dreaded share screen and uh, share some slides to, to talk us through this. Here we go. Hopefully that's all working out for everybody. Yeah, um, thank you. Great. Uh, so just to say, this is going to be quite a rapid run through what might be a normally be a process that one takes a bit more time over. So please feel free to post any questions in the chat and we'll try and get uh, get round to addressing them. Um, it, it's a very interesting introduction there and uh, I, I thank you so much for uh, for the different perspectives. And I think, you know, it's a tricky question because we've got things that might be both cause and effect or have a complex relationship with each other uh, and we felt that because the two 
cohort studies have been published so close together we needed to look at them at the same time to try and uh, make the best use of time as it were. So what are we actually doing here when we're talking about critical appraisal uh, uh, of research and why do we need to do it? Just a very sort of quick reminder, a lot of folk will be familiar with this concept, but maybe not everyone is. Um, one of the unfortunate things we know from looking at research over the years is that, if you like, not all evidence is created equal. Um, some papers, just by the method, by the way the approach they take, maybe are more reliable than others. Um, and some studies have estimated that as many as 50% of published papers contain some sort of bias. So what this means is when we're looking at evidence is that we have to rule out the possibility that bias caused the result. Uh, we also need to rule out or, or think about the possibility the results could occur by chance. And I think particularly when we're trying to, to think about the associations and the way two different things influence each other, it's important we bear those in mind because we can quite easily be misled by, by uh, uh, random results, for example. And there's a kind of general approach that uh, is used in healthcare looking at uh, uh, research evidence. Um, uh, and we start off by being clear about what the research question is. Then we ask about the methods. Then we look at the, uh, uh, at the results to see how, uh, if they're clinically important uh, and how we apply them uh, uh, in practice. So I think in this session, if we get through one, two and a bit of three, we'll be doing well for a discussion uh, of, of, of what this all means. So the two studies we're looked at are both population cohort studies. So I'm just going to talk uh, uh, briefly about what that means uh, in terms of what the researchers did. In this type of study, the, one of the big pluses of a population cohort study is that the researchers try to include everybody uh, within a population in the study. And that gives you very reliable data about that population because you've got everybody in it. Uh, and it's likely to be data that can be applied to, to other similar groups because it's so such a big population. So what we look for is a well-defined, clearly defined group of people and a plan for how we're going to analyze them over time. Uh, we recruit the population, we follow them up uh, and we measure uh, exposures, such as in this case, do there, are there autistic traits in, uh, uh, in, involved? We measure outcomes such as uh, eating disorder outcomes, and we look at the associate, association between them. And we, because we're doing this forwards over time, we can even look at, at cause and effect or which comes first. We can explore the impact of all sorts of different uh, variables on the, uh, 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 on the effects that we see. One of the things to point out about these two studies is that um, the, the particular analysis we're looking at wasn't a part of the original plan, but what the researchers did was the, because there are, there are two studies that have gone over a long period of time, they're looking at the, the evidence that they've got available. They're looking at the, the data that's been turned up. So if you like, we're going back retrospectively to look at, uh, at the data around eating disorders and autism. So some of the things we need to look at, look out for here are, are sort of, I think, important things that we'll see in the discussion. Uh, so we, we need to look at the other possible things about the population that might influence them to, uh, to, to give a certain, a certain response. Are certain people dropping out for certain reasons? And those sorts of confounders might, might introduce a bit of bias to the result. Um, we also need to think about how are they measuring autism and how are we measuring <clears throat> eating disorders? Because those measures really define what we can say uh, uh, as a result of, of the individual studies. We also need to, so we might, do we think, you know, are we happy that the measure we use for autistic traits are equivalent between the two studies or at different points in time? Uh, and if not, what does that tell us? Um, and the other thing we just need to be uh, mindful of is that when you go and look at a body of data and you do analyses, there's a risk of false positive uh, results, of you finding patterns that might have appeared by chance. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things that we bear in mind when we're appraising this sort of study. 
Um, I, you might kind of summarize that is, is that if you go backwards and just dredge through lots of data, you might, you'll see patterns in the stars that fit the things that you want to look for. So I grabbed this off a cycling website. Um, so they see the arrangement of, of data in a certain way. So the, the process I used for, for appraising the two studies follows this checklist, which uh, we've got a link to in the uh, 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 in the slides, which we're going to upload to the website. This is a, a list of questions you just run through to uh, and check against the, the, the reported methods to see if there are any risks of bias as we, we, we looked at just before. So now we're looking in a bit more detail about the two studies, uh, and we can start off by thinking about how they define the different elements of the research question. Um, so we've already mentioned that the, the populations involved were the whole population for, that was eligible within twins within Sweden, young people born in the Avon area of the UK. Um, uh, and they, they both, both studies had measures that they used for autistic traits, but they used a slightly different method. So we used the social and communications checklist uh, in the Alsbach study uh, and the, uh, the CAT study included uh, other items as well. So uh, there was ADHD items, I think, and there was uh, repetitive behavioral uh, uh, items. So there were some slight differences in the way that the two studies conceived of autism and or autistic traits. Uh, and I think this, this third point around how eating disorders uh, are measured is particularly important in this discussion uh, because the CAT study, the Swedish study, was looking very specifically at diagno diagnosis of anorexia uh, or people who had been receiving treatment. Um, whereas the ALSPAC study has a much broader definition which included any disordered eating behaviour. So that perhaps suggests Alspach might have, a, you know, these, these two studies are certainly looking at slightly different questions and, and maybe need to be interpreted uh, slightly differently. So that's a kind of overview of the, uh, the methods that were used in the two studies. And when we look at their findings, um, we, we find quite different results. Uh, so on the face of it, the results are kind of and slightly contradictory and um, with roughly similar size of sample in each uh, in each group uh, around five to six thousand participants um, but in the Alspac study we found that there was a, 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 a the, the autism scores were associated associated with a higher rate of, uh, of disordered eating behavior uh, and this number the relative risk of 1.25 is, a, is an average number that applies across the whole measure. So you'd expect some, some variation uh, from one individual to another, but it equates to roughly a 25% higher uh, rate, roughly. Um, the other thing to say, I think, about the Alspach results was that we had quite consistent, with all the different ways that they modeled the data, they, they, they found more or less a consistent result, which suggests that, that, that it is a true result and not a random uh, uh, the result of random chance. And in contrast to that, on the face of it, the CAT study couldn't find an association between autism scores, particularly a uh, younger age, compare, looking at that, uh, uh, their association with the diagnosis of anorexia. Um, they did find some evidence in some of the more repetitive behavioral aspects of uh, uh, autistic traits at age 18. Um, uh, so, on the face of it, these results are quite different, but when you remember, actually, they're looking at quite different questions, perhaps they're not as contradictory as, as we might think. I think one of the key things we do need to be cautious about with both the studies is that the number of patients that we followed up weren't all the ones who joined the study at the start. So there was quite a lot of people who were either for, for either lost to follow up or who didn't have enough data to, uh, uh, to be included in the study. They didn't, they might've been missing some or maybe they didn't, didn't uh, respond to a certain uh, stage of the, the data gathering process. Um, 
that might look like a, quite a small follow-up rate, but uh, in the context of this type of study, this is very typical. Uh, it isn't some anything out of the ordinary, but it does mean I think we need to be cautious about how uh, uh, how solid our belief is in the results, if you like. Um, both teams took efforts to try and fight, understand that. Uh, the ALSPAC team did quite a lot of sensitivity analysis to see how the the results might be affected if there was a lot of bias in the in the attrition and in the, in the dropouts. Uh, they did find that the folk who uh, had missing data tended to have younger, less well-educated mothers uh, and who, who might also have a history of depression. So that might suggest there is that there could be uh, the loss to follow up might have, have affected the results. So it's just something else that we need to bear in mind, a kind of little health warning, if you like, before we uh, 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 go forward to the next stage in interpreting the results. So I've done a very quick overview of the, the checklist and uh, as I said there's some areas where we need to, 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 to be careful around the, the attrition and, uh, and I, but I think the key thing is we need to bear in mind that one study looks a slightly different question from the other. I, I did mention that there's there was a consistent pattern in ALSPAC and uh, this, I thought this worth just showing this excerpt from the results which showed you that there's a there's around a 25% difference and that was consistent across uh, uh, across the study in that the, the autism scores uh, tended to be higher uh, in people with disordered eating and it was also See, people who had weekly compared with monthly episodes of disordered eating, they experienced uh, uh, a, a higher increase in uh, the autistic traits. And just very quickly on, on cats, an interesting piece of detail from that paper was that uh, the, the impact of the repetitive behaviour uh, in girls when they were, particularly in the subset who were girls who were 18 and diagnosed with with, uh, with anorexia. So that sort of, I think, chimes in with what uh, Lisa was saying earlier. So my conclusions were that, um, the, as we said before, the, the, the studies looked at quite different things. So although they, they seem to have different results, uh, I think the, the, the findings may, are sort of maybe compatible with one another. Um, I would like to be particularly interested to hear what uh, what the rest of the team think about this, and particularly possible effects of camouflaging the uh, uh, the fact we've got a very heterogeneous group with any uh, di uh, disordered eating behaviour. Um, so, my, I guess <laughs> this isn't a clear cut conclusion. This is one where we need to look at the evidence and engage our our, our judgment and think about. Uh, patient experiences and values. Thank you very much. I'll stop my slide share now. Thanks, Douglas. So I'm sure um, both Francesca and Lisa have got a kind of right to reply slot here. So Francesca, do you want to go first? What do you think of what Douglas has presented? Oh, I think it's a wonderful job summarising our, our studies. Um, I think, uh, yes, there were some differences between um, our, our two studies. And I think one, uh, one thing that we had in our outcome measure of disordered eating that I think differed from, from Lisa's study, we, we, that we included behaviours that are more typical of bulimia and binge eating um, and uh, sort of other subthreshold eating disorders where binge eating behaviours, we had purging and we had fasting and dieting. So some of the children we included could have been on the more the anorexia spectrum or the bulimic spectrum and, and so on. So it was, as, uh, as Douglas was just saying, there was an heterogeneous group um, that we, we picked up in our study. But I don't know if there were specific questions about um, our study in particular. I saw that there was one question perhaps on excluding people that would have had autism. I saw a question coming up. So in, in our study, we we measured autistic traits at age seven. Um, so our assumption was that at that point, most children wouldn't have had um, an eating disorder. Uh, of course, we didn't have any way of measuring that because we didn't have a measure of eating disorder at age seven or disordered eating. Um, but we thought if we pick up 
uh, autistic traits at that age, perhaps we could be somewhat confident that most eating disorders wouldn't have emerged um, at that point. Um, so that is a question that I saw popping up before. There's also a question about boys. Were they included in the cohort? Yes. So in our, in our study where I think Lisa took our leave at concept for our study, but yeah, we included boys uh, as well. We, of course, had fewer boys with the outcome uh, compared to girls. So when we analysed the data separately for boys and girls, just to see whether there were any different patterns, uh, we had a lot less sort of statistical power. We didn't have enough boys to do uh, the same level of detailed analysis that we could do for for the girls because they were they were a much smaller group but the patterns were exactly the same in boys and girls and we're going to come on and talk about implications and what we should do now but first of all lisa do you want to also um say anything in response to douglas's presentation? yeah so i do agree with uh, francesca and douglas that that at first sight our results seemed very contradictory but they are actually not so much um because as francesca said the the, the um what they included was a very, very broad outcome, uh, the disordered eating behaviors. And they also included um, dieting, for example, if I'm right. And dieting is very common, right? Many people diet. So uh, yeah, this yields a higher prevalence of these behaviors. And then you have also more power to detect effect sizes. And we, of course, for, focused on a very narrow phenotype, which was the anorexia nervosa, uh, which is much less common. Um, and I also think uh, what is... Uh, what should be noted is that the effect size wasn't so large uh, of the increase of autistic traits. Um, and also that we didn't find any association with the actual disorder anorexia. This also points us to that there don't seem to be huge effect sizes here because otherwise we would have picked up on them. Um, because if I'm correct, there's another study, Francesca, that followed up your sample, right? Uh, with eating disorder diagnosis up to the age of 18. Um, the Schaumberg et al. study, um, right? And they didn't find very clear associations with eating disorder diagnoses either. So I feel like there seems to be an association between autism and disordered eating behaviors, but that doesn't always mean it's also um, related to full-blown eating disorders, as we would sometimes say, meeting all the diagnostic criteria. Okay, so I want to open it up now. Um... Because I think by far the most interesting conversation we can have for the audience at this point is to, is to think a bit more broadly about these two conditions. And we've got a few questions that have come in already. So, uh, Francesca, could you start by answering this one for me? A few people have mentioned the role that anxiety plays here. Um, is it possible that anxiety is a mediator somehow between eating disorders and autism? Well, that was actually one of our um, hypotheses uh, at the end. So how we hypothesize this link could happen uh, in our, um, at least for the data that we observed. And we know that anxiety is very common in, in people with eating disorder, anorexia um, as well. And it is similarly common uh, in ASD. So we thought that perhaps one of these, the mechanism could be that there is anxiety and that perhaps even girls could be camouflage more, could be hiding it more or better when they're younger. And then when they reach adolescence and life becomes a bit more complicated in adolescence, if you're navigating a whole new world and new friends, this anxiety could really become a lot more difficult to manage and disordered eating behavior, eating disorder could become a way to sort of handle that, that anxiety. Um, so that was one, was actually one of our uh, hypotheses in, in the study. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, and we've also had quite a few comments relating to the kind of biological underpinnings of these conditions and what we know in that sense about the kind of genetic risk and the overlap. But Lisa, do you want to give us a bit of an overview of, of what we know in that sense? Yeah. So there are a lot of genetic studies ongoing for all kinds of uh, psychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders. So there's this big consortium, the Psychiatric uh, Genomics Consortium with different groups. Each of the group investigates a specific disorder. And then, of course, what is very interesting then there is to look at the overlap of genetics, what we call genetic correlations between different disorders. And uh, there are some studies that have, for example, looked at the genetic correlation between autism and anorexia. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was not significant. So that means it was quite low. 
But a problem here is that the genetic studies for anorexia nervosa are not yet well powered because very, very large sample sizes are needed here. And we are continuing to collect these data and then uh, we will rerun these analyses in a couple of years and then maybe we get different results. So this uh, will take some time. And I think my note. Yeah, let's start with lost Lisa for a second. Okay, let's move on. She did mention in advance that she might have a problem with her internet connection. So hopefully she can join us again uh, in a second. Um, I wanted to also touch on ARFID, um, which um, some of you I'm sure have heard of, which is a relatively new eating disorder. ARFID stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. It's something that's been um, researched a, a certain amount and it's been put forward as a, a new category in the international classification of disease um, but it's certainly something which is very new in terms of services and research. Um, do we know how common ARFIT is in people with autism Francesco? Is that a really hard question to answer? Um, well ARFIT is not my primary uh, area of, of research so I don't have on top of my head um, prevalence figures um, but I think that the belief is that it's probably the most common um, the common eating disorders particularly in, in childhood among um, children who have autism um, and when we look at ARFID as a different a slightly different distribution compared to um, gender distribution compared to other eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia where we know that there's usually many more girls diagnosed um, with an and bulimia, but as we are fit, we tend to see a bit more boys. Uh, and so that reflects sort of this comorbidity with um, a neurodevelopmental condition like ASD or ADHD. Um, but unfortunately, ARFID doesn't, there's not much research on ARFID uh, at all. We don't know very much on it. And as you said, that reflects in um, maybe services also not being there as much as they should be. Uh, for children uh, with these difficulties that often are not recognised perhaps until very late and there have been in the news and in past years you know children that have suffered very big health problems later on in adolescence because of the very restricted diet and that had gone sort of undiagnosed for years so we know little about eating disorder but I think our feed is we know even even less uh, on our feed. And I guess there's a danger that um, calling it a disorder makes a lot of people immediately feel quite worried. Um, I must admit, I looked at the BEAT eating disorders website page on ARFID and as somebody who's got a six-year-old and two eight-year-old children, I thought, oh, I can relate to a lot of those um, behaviours, avoiding food. How are we going to be sure that we bring in something and it's not um, just medicalising a whole lot of young people who don't actually have a disorder? Yeah, so I um, I can speak for some researcher that um, I've been involved with, but I'm not first um, primary author on, but uh, I know someone who's um, researching this in China, and we see the most children as a phase where they are more picky around food, and that tends to resolve quite naturally over time, and it's quite a common experience of childhood. I think the problem, the more problematic one would be the ones that persist uh, in into mid-child and late childhood, and then adolescence and I think that is where probably uh, it could become a health concern as well because you know there could be deficiencies and and, and so sort of um health outcomes so yeah it's a good point that we shouldn't medicalize anyone who's a picky eater at some point in childhood so um but clinic I don't have that clinical expertise to, to give insight on how do we discern uh, which one is a child that could have a problem from and now that it could be more transient experience. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much, everyone, for the comments and the links that you're posting in the chat about Arfid. That's really helpful. Uh, Lisa's come back on. That's great. Welcome back, Lisa. Well, sorry we missed you for a sorry couple. Sorry for that. Hope your internet is working now. Um, we've moved on and we're discussing Arfid a little bit, and Francesca has shared uh, what she knows about that. Do you want to add anything from your perspective about Arfid and autism research? Right. <laughs> now, I'm not sure what uh, Francesca has said already, uh, but I do think that um, ARFID is yeah, very important to, to include in our perspective now, especially looking at the link between um, 
autism and anorexia um, because I think that many of us hypothesize that um, ARFID could lie somewhere there on the pathway uh, that many people with autism might actually have ARFID first and then de later develop anorexia, but also that um, people with anorexia might actually be misdiagnosed and have ARFID uh, rather than anorexia with um, the body image issues and worries associated with anorexia. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. So I want to talk a bit about what we do in terms of services now. Um, and it's interesting that we've got a kind of a UK and a Sweden perspective on this, because I'm sure services in our two different countries are quite different. Um, Lucy, I wanted to start by asking you a, quite a general question, I think, just really in your experience, how well you think eating disorder services currently support autistic people? I'm really interested in whether we need to adapt our services so that we can provide better care for autistic people or whether we need a, a, a different service entirely. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm 22 now. Um, I was diagnosed with um, anorexia when I was 13 um, and I was hospitalised um, from 13 years to about I was 16 so I was in and out of hospital inpatient um so I was in um quite a bad bad condition um I my psychiatrist mentioned the fact that it, you know it could be I did have autistic traits but I, it was never really looked into um I think the primary concern was to to treat the immediate effects of my eating disorder and get me out of hospital um, and to kind of resume my life again. Um, but I think it, it was kind of mentioned and I think there was an awareness of it, but at the time, I don't think that referring me on to get either get assessed for autism or to get treated for autism was a primary concern. So. For me, I was diagnosed in adulthood um, when I realised that the condition wasn't kind of improving and it was very frustrating for me because I was trying everything but I was still feeling kind of entrapped within a certain mindset. So that kind of urged me to privately um, get an assessment um, and, you know, be diagnosed as a result of that. So I think in terms of the NHS I don't really think there is the support there for people who who you know might present with that issue I don't think that there's funding um and I mean just from my own personal experience the waiting list to get seen is months potentially even years um so yeah for me it, it wasn't a positive experience because it took me years to be diagnosed um but I, I don't I don't know about other people's experience thank you I'm really interested in um you know how as a society we can provide a better world to live in for neurodiverse individuals I think that you know we're on this beginning of the journey um and there's a lot more interest in that as a as a thing um but I wonder if you've got any thoughts about what you see as priorities in terms of the health system. What do you think could have really helped you um, as a neurodiverse person within an eating disorder service? I think there are particular things that they could have done differently that would really have made it easier for you. Um, yeah, I mean, within an already overstretched service, I think it's difficult to make them kind of adjustments and kind of view someone as a whole person not not just their eating disorder because I think when you're in kind of an acute service like I was um you are literally just seen as a walking eating disorder and you know your symptoms that's ultimately what you're there to get rid of and they're there to kind of you know make you eat and make you stop exercising and um kind of change your beliefs about you know food and dieting and exercise but I don't I didn't feel like 
the whole of who I was was taken into account and I think that's something that needs to be kind of readdressed in mental health services um and yeah I guess to stop categorizing people and see them as you know a whole person with individual needs and everyone's recovery will look very different um so yeah I, I agree with you I think that change does need to happen brilliant really powerful thank you um can I just ask a question oh, sorry. Sure, Lisa, you go on. I would I would be really really interested in hearing from Lucy um what has changed for you after you received your autism diagnosis and also specifically in terms of your eating disorder yeah um so for me just clarity about why I was the way I was and that I wasn't weird um and that uh, I felt like I was constantly fighting like a losing battle in terms of I was meant to be getting well but I still had kind of rules and um I had kind of rigid structures around my eating and the way I felt towards food and um just life in general and I think just being able to kind of like understand that and not feel guilty or like it was my fault that I wasn't in quotes getting better um and I think that gave me an understanding that I was kind of different in that sense and that actually you know living with certain food rules and preferences didn't always have to be seen in a negative light like they normally are because actually that helped me function and helped me cope um and I mean obviously that's different as in you know getting really unwell and having a restricted life and you know the physical health effects of starvation I think that's completely different as to kind of feeling safe with certain foods and allowing them to get on with the rest of your life and the other parts of you know what's important to you um but I think yeah just having that understanding was really important for me after diagnosis um and I think for me just getting the right support um so I I'm currently receiving support for my autism which I wasn't before and that's definitely helped me um so yeah I think that's kind of that's what I'd say is is the changing factor for me that's great thank you Lucy Lisa do you want to give us a picture of what's happening in Sweden what's the situation like where you are in terms of eating disorder services generally and then in terms of services specifically for autistic people uh, well first of all i i'm not a clinician so i only know what i'm told from my clinician colleagues but um as i understand it the services here are very very separate from each other uh, which of course is not great at all <laughs> And uh, what we also feel here is that autism is more and more uh, singled out uh, because, I mean, I come from a neurodevelopmental disorders background in a way that's, uh, I did my PhD in a, in a center which focused on neurodevelopmental disorders research. And uh, we know that their autism is um, very often occurs together with ADHD and all the other neurodevelopmental disorders, right? So, and that they should always be considered uh, in context with each other. And that it's very likely that you have another neurodevelopmental disorder if you have autism. Um, but instead we see that there are these specialized uh, assessment and treatment centers for autism. Um, while everything else is um, disconnected and not really considered. And I think this also applies to the eating disorders. And then when, when clinicians detect that uh, children with autism would have problems with eating as well, they have nowhere really to go, as long as it's not a diagnosis that is anorexia or bulimia or other feeding disorder. But especially for ARFIT at the moment, I mean, not, uh, there's not much knowledge. Um, about the diagnosis itself and then even if clinicians think this is uh, probably an RFID uh, case diagnosis then um, these people have nowhere to go basically it's not integrated at all yet into the healthcare system so here we really have to work hard uh, to yeah get it integrated really yeah, I think there's a strong message that comes from a lot of our webinars, which is that 
having separate services for separate conditions where actually people move from one condition to the next and we all have complex lives or we end up with seven or eight conditions or seven or eight diagnoses that's not helpful for anyone um uh, I suppose in England, Francesca, we've seen this big investment in eating disorder services over the last seven or eight years. Um, how do you think we should target further investment if we're really going to try and support young people with eating disorders and autism? Well, I think, um, so yeah, so CAMS has received more investment. I think the same has not been for adult uh, services. So I would say that that is already uh, an area where more investment would be needed because there are many, probably many more people on waiting lists in, in the adult population and there's probably a very high level of comorbidities there as well. So I come from, I think my background is more in, in thinking about prevention uh, as opposed to sort of clinical services and I think there should be perhaps more support available even in schools or you know to, for kids who might be experiencing difficulties that could perhaps help um you know not not progressing so far uh, in developing disorders over time but you know for in order to do that we need to understand what are these risk factors what are these pathways um that explain this comorbidity so perhaps more research but maybe more investment also in, in prevention and helping these people these children beforehand um they saw there were comments about passage to secondary school and that could be a moment of of risk and yeah that's I think that's definitely probably very true um so maybe that that is what I think perhaps not not an answer about services uh, overall but <laughs> so I think I'm going to ask all three of you the same question now I think it's um unsurprising to everyone that we're going to be fighting for more research money for eating disorders research um it, you know, mental health research generally gets very poor funding in comparison to everything else. But then even within mental health research, eating disorders gets remarkably little money compared to the impact it has on people's lives, on society widely. How do you think we should be targeting the money we've got? So what are the most important things do you think that we should be researching specifically about eating disorders and autism? Uh, Lisa, do you want to ask that, answer that first? Yeah, sure. Well, as I said before, I would really start by taking ARFID into the picture. And then um, I think that these uh, population-based cohort studies like um, our two papers have, have been are really the way to go here because we talked about earlier that uh, basically when a person comes to the clinic with anorexia or another eating disorder, it's already too, too late, right? I mean, from a clinical perspective, but also from a research perspective, because then it's very hard to know what was there first and what caused what. And in order to dis disentangle these uh, causal mechanisms and risk factors, um, it is important to start at the very beginning, which means in pregnancy, <laughs> basically. Um, and then from then on, we would uh, yeah, include, in the best case, a range of measurements uh, for all kinds of traits and disorders and have very close follow-ups. Um, so this, this would be the dream scenario, right? But then on the other hand, this also means a quite high burden for the participants in such studies. And we do see a certain tiredness um, of people answering survey after survey after survey um, in the population. So that's also a problem apart from the, the research funding that, is, uh, that could be more. Absolutely. Yeah. How about you, Francesca? Anything to add? Any other research avenues you'd like to look at? Very, very similar answer from, from me, but I think um, also understanding what are the experiences of, of girls and boys and if they are different, because at the moment, I think a problem that we have is that how we diagnose autism is being informed by presentations in, in boys traditionally. And in the same way that we have with eating disorders, probably how we measure eating disorders has been uh, dictated by our belief that they are very common in, in girls and maybe in boys they present slightly different so I think more research on on how perhaps informed by people with lived experience and informing what kind of questions should we be asking uh, and so I've really that that lived experience input into future cohorts because we really need um, these longitudinal studies if we want to understand the direction of, of risk and also what comes in between that we can intervene upon 
to design intervention. So I think it's both. How about you, Lucy? Have you got particular questions that you think scientists should be prioritising? Mm, I think just more research in general. Um, I agree with Francesca. There are stereotypes around um, autism as a male kind of condition and anorexia or you know eating disorders in general as a, a female condition. And I think neither of those are helpful. Um, in diagnosis and prevention and um, they kind of muddy the they muddy the um the kind of explanations we can give to these conditions because I guess if you're a female and you kind of present with autistic traits it's easier to say you know you have anorexia than you know you might actually have autism and yeah I agree I think that it's it's a very under-researched area and it's also a very complex area. So I think just more research in general. Thank you, that's great. So we're pretty much out of time now. We've just got a couple of minutes left. I just want to, first of all, ask Matt to uh, share the poll. We normally evaluate these sessions. So just tell us if you enjoyed the session and if you would recommend it to a colleague. 10 is a lot and one is not very much. So tell us what you think of this that's really helpful for us to see thank you um and while you're doing that i'm just going to thank our excellent panel uh thanks very much to francesca and lisa lucy douglas uh anya who's been um, manning the comments and putting the questions into our whatsapp group um who's been fantastic as always thanks very much to the mcpin young people's network who we run these webinars with who are always fantastic in helping us find brilliant young people like Lucy um, to come along and share their experiences. Um, if you want to tweet about this webinar, the hashtag is Cam's Campfire. Please do, uh, when you come off Zoom, go on Twitter and tell us what you think. Um, thanks very much for your feedback there. It's great to see so many people giving us a um, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's very nice. Thank you. Um, and yeah. Our next CAMS Campfire is on the 22nd of November. Uh, it's on bullying and parenting. Um, and yeah, back to you, Matt. Find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.